असतो मा सद्गमय तमसो मा ज्योतिर्गमय मृत्युर्मा अमृत गमय ओ शाति 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 ओ लीडस फ्रॉम द अनरियल टू द रियल लीडस फ्रॉम डार्कनेस एंड टू लाइट लीडस फ्रॉम डेथ टू इमोटैलिटी Om peace 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 Good morning and namaskar to all of you those who are present here I see a few more masks than usual <laughs> and our virtual audience all over the world The subject today is direct knowledge it is all something that we are all interested in in Vedanta enlightenment or direct knowledge um we have been talking about we have been discussing the mantra from the brihadaranyak upanishad brihadaranyak upanishad 4412 that if an individual like us if we were to realize that we are this infinite existence consciousness bliss then desiring what and for whose sake would one continue to suffer along with the body atmanam chedvijaniyat अयम अस्मी पुषा किमीछन काम शरीर अनुसंज्वरेत वेरी ब्यूटिफुल मंत्र फ्रॉम दि ब्रदारणिक उपनिषद एंड इट सॉट ऑफ इनकैप्सुलेट्स द एंटायरिटी ऑफ स्पिरिचुअल लाइफ ऑफ एंटायरिटी ऑफ वेदांत एट लीस्ट दैट इफ वी जस्ट लाइक एनी ऑफ एस पुरुषा द इंडिविजुअल बीइंग इफ वी वे टू रियलाइज दैट i am i am asmi i am asmi means i am this this reality what is it like it's like till now i considered myself to be this this waking person with a waking experience or in my dreams the dreamer with a dream or even in deep sleep i was the one who went to sleep and i had this blank experience of deep sleep but now i realize no i am the underlying consciousness in all of these three states i am that fourth the turiya the one unlimited consciousness in which the waker and the waker's world are appearing and disappearing in which the dreamer and the dream dream world are appearing and disappearing in which the deep sleep experience is also superimposed that underlying reality i am if i were to realize this atmanam ched vijaniya i am asmi i am this fourth if i were to realize this or i am not the physical body not the subtle body not the uh, causal body deha traya vilakshana atma the physical body sthula sharira the subtle body sukshma sharira and the causal body the karana sharira i am the consciousness which is the witness of these and independent of these three these three bodies or these three aspects of my human personality i am that consciousness in which these in, in which the physical and the subtle and the causal arise play around and disappear if i were to realize this pancha kosha vilakshana atma if i were to realize that what is most evident to me about myself physical body the 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 vital body the mental body uh, the um the intellectual body or the causal body annamaya pranamaya manomaya vigyanamaya anandamaya this is what i think myself to be um but if i realize that i am the witness of all of them pancha kosha vilakshana atma if i were to realize myself as that then desiring what and for whose sake would i continue to suffer along with along with what the body what body is meant here all of that the three physical subtle and causal or the pancha kosha the five sheets or the phys- or the waking dreaming deep sleep so if i were to realize this and to understand this we use the story of the 10th man vidyaranya who has written in the panchadashi vidyaranya swami has written nearly 300 verses in the 7th chapter of his masterpiece the panchadashi the 7th chapter did uh, this lamp of bliss he writes 300 verses 
nearly 298 verses to explain this mantra. And there he uses, extensively uses the tenth man story. And we know the tenth man story, how these ten friends were, went on a journey, crossed a river, and then they were struck with a doubt whether we have all crossed or did somebody drown. And then they started counting. And we all know that each person counted the other nine but forgot to count himself. And then they came to the conclusion, wrong conclusion, that the tenth man has drowned because we can't see him. Because we can't see the tenth man, the tenth man, our tenth friend, has drowned. And because the tenth person has drowned and they are in sorrow, they start weeping and wailing till a wise person comes along to help them out and says, the tenth man is there. This is important. The tenth man is there. And where is the tenth man? And he says, you count. And he tells one person that you count the others. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then he says, thou art the tenth. He tells the counter, you are the tenth. And that man realizes, oh, I am the tenth. Uh, so the tenth man is found. The sorrow is gone. That, oh, obviously the tenth person did not drown. And there is joy in the recovery, within quotes, of their own friend. This is a story, very beautiful story. And Vidyaranya uses this to analyze the seven stages of the spiritual journey. Seven stages. The first stage is ignorance, a general ignorance about the tenth person. And the second stage is, uh, just like that we have ignorance about Brahman, our real nature. We don't know about it. Second stage is avaranam, an expressed ignorance which hides the reality from us. What is it like? The tenth man is not experienced. I don't see the tenth person. I counted. I don't see the tenth person. And therefore the tenth person does not exist. Nasti na bhati does not exist and is not experienced. There is no such thing as Brahman. I do not experience Brahman and there is no such thing as Brahman. That is avarana, hiding the reality. Second stage of spiritual life. And spiritual life has not begun. It's, we are already headed towards doom there. Second stage. The third stage is, oh my God, our friend is drowned. I don't see the tenth person. Therefore, tenth person doesn't exist. And therefore, the tenth person must have drowned. Oh, our friend has drowned. What a tragedy. Samsara. I am in samsara. Old age and disease and coronavirus and death and despair. <coughs> All of this is the samsara, third stage. And then the fourth stage, that wise person comes and says, don't cry, the tenth person is there. Fourth stage. And that fourth stage is in Vedanta, when Vedanta comes and tells us, we are exposed to this idea for the first time. You are actually not the body. You are not the mind. There is some reality called Brahman, existence, consciousness, place, where there is no, de no death, no disease, no old age, um, which is infinite, where there is no sorrow, no suffering. There is this reality. So that is like the fourth stage. When the wise person came and said that, that there is a tenth person. We still don't know who is the tenth person. They don't understand it. Where is the tenth person? But they, are, they get the idea that it's possible that the tenth person is still alive. We get the idea that an infinite reality is there. There is something by realizing which we can go beyond sorrow. There is something. Fourth stage. The fifth stage is when, crucial, when this person says, you are the tenth. And for the first time, he actually experiences, re experiences within quotes, realizes, oh, I am the tenth. A direct knowledge is there. I am the tenth. And then the sixth and seventh is the result of this phalam. And that uh, sorrow goes away and there is joy. Uh, similarly, when we get this direct experience, Oh, I am Brahman. I am unlimited. I am not the body, not the mind. Uh, I am this infinite immortal radiance which was, will be, and ever, will, is, is and will ever be. When I realize this directly, that is the fifth stage. And the result of it will be, all sorrow of samsara is transcended. Body will continue to age and get disease and die. Uh, problems in the world will continue to be there. But I know a place of security and peace and transcendence, which is ever available to me, which is my own nature. So I transcend the sorrow of samsara and 
I attain fulfillment. Ful- why fulfillment? Because I'm infinite. There's nothing beyond me. Everything is included and is encompassed by my infinite being. So I'm fulfilled. Joy, ananda prapti. Dukkha nivritti, tripti. Tripti is bliss. That's why Vidyaranya calls this chapter the lamp of bliss. So seven stages. Now in the mantra, when you're talking about I am Masmiti Purusha, when I realize I am this infinite being, I am the fourth beyond the waking, dreaming, deep sleep. I am that underlying consciousness beyond the five sheets of the human personality. I am the witness of the three bodies, physical, subtle and causal. When I realize this, which state is it? Of the seven stages, which state, which step is it? This is the fifth one. This fifth one is the stage of direct knowledge. That's our subject today. That's why the subject is so interesting. Here we are considering for the first time enlightenment itself. We keep talking about Brahma Jnana, the knowledge of Brahman, Atma Jnana, the self-realization, God-realization, enlightenment. So this is this direct knowledge we are talking about. I am Masmi. I am this. Oh, I am the tenth. The fifth stage. When we awaken to this, this is direct knowledge. In uh, Sanskrit, Aparoksha Jnanam. Aparoksha Jnanam. So this Aparoksha Jnanam is what we are talking about. Take a moment to consider how incredible this thing is. How, how radical this claim is. In Vedanta, when we talk about this um, realization... What are we realizing? Where is it? When is it? What is it? If you consider in in terms of time, space and object. In Vedanta, see how radical it is. It's not a journey in space. Sometimes we talk about religion as if it's going somewhere. Um, Going to uh, Benares or Makkah or Jerusalem. All of them dangerous places to go on right now. uh, For (laughs) either war or coronavirus or something. Uh, Or going to um, heaven as understood variously in different religious traditions. In Vaikuntha, the abode of Narayan or Vishnu, uh, or the Christian heaven or the Muslim heaven uh, or the pure land of of Mahayana Buddhism. A place. Vedanta is not talking about going to a place. It's not a journey in space from here to there. No. Or we talk about going to you know, in a journey in time. Not now, then. After death, you will see God. There are big, big billboards. After death, you will see God. Call one eight zero zero something like that. After death. After death means after some time. Not now, then. After the coming of the avatar or the messiah or something. After. After. Even after samadhi. After enlightenment. After. Vedanta is saying, not after. It's not a journey in time. It's not even a journey in object. What the journey in object means? Some other thing called God. Something apart from. Vedanta says, It's not an object which you will worship as this. It's not a journey from the self to the other. It's actually a journey from the self to the self. In the sense of smallest self. To capitalize self. So, the take a moment to appreciate what how radical Advaita Vedanta is. It's it is not journey from one place to another. It's all places. It is here. It is not a journey from one time to another time, from now till after. No, it is at all times eternal, and it is now. It is not a journey from one thing to another, from myself to something else called God. No. It is I myself. My own reality. So, then what kind of a journey? If it's not a journey in space, not a journey in time, not a journey from one object to another, then what is the spiritual journey in Advaita Vedanta? It's a journey from ignorance to knowledge. From not knowing, not realizing, to knowing or realizing. Just like the tenth man story. The tenth man, realized the tenth man was the whole purpose of it. And it was not a journey 
to some other place to find the tenth man, not to wait for the tenth man to come, not even to find out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and some other tenth man will be out there. That's what he was expecting. Not even that. He himself was the tenth man. This is what Advaita Vedanta is claiming. If you distinguish it from religion as it is normally understood, normally understood as devotional approach, theistic approach, bhakti or faith approach, believe in it that there is a reality called God or something, and believe in it. Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta says, no, no, not like that. In the tenth man case, where, where you ask to believe only initially that there is a tenth man, but you are ultimately supposed to realize, I am the tenth. Not believe that you are the tenth. Not have faith that you are the tenth. You have to actually get it. Then it has worked. Another type of religious approach is the yogic or mystical approach. Where you don't have to believe, but you practice this, a set of physical and psychic exercises, meditations. And you get extraordinary samadhi experiences. And that proves to us the claim of religion. And by the way, the bhakti approach, the yogic approach, they are all true. They are all true and they work. But I am trying to distinguish what we are doing today from that. No, not even that. This is the uh, knowledge approach. The, the, tenth, the person was supposed to realize directly, straight away, uh, direct knowledge of I am the tenth. Not by action, not by belief, not by meditation or es esoteric mystical practices, but by direct knowledge. Did the wise person tell that, the, that uh, man that here are the nine, serve them with your, all your heart and sincerity, you will find the tenth. By action? No, no. Did he say that the tenth person is there and believe it and that's it? No. Did he say that sit down and breathe in this way and hold the breath and then concentrate? No. He gave an exercise in enquiry. Count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then thou art the tenth. And he gets it. <coughs> this is called the knowledge approach. The path of jnana. The direct knowledge. So that's why I wanted to distinguish and we get a clarity of about what exactly it is going on. So when the Up Upanishad says, I am Asmiti Purushaha, this has to be realized, like the tenth person realized, I am the tenth. And Vedanta helps us to do that. This direct knowledge is what we are going to talk about today. The word used in Sanskrit is Aparoksha Jnana. Before we delve into it, it's uh, important to clarify the terms. Aparoksha jnana as against paroksha jnana. Aparoksha means direct knowledge, paroksha indirect knowledge. Direct knowledge, aparoksha jnana, indirect knowledge, paroksha jnana. A little more in detail if you look closely at it. Aksha, the word aksha means eyes. And in general, all sense organs. So, um, the eyes and the ears and the skin and the nose and the tongue all together these are each of them they are called aksha and the knowledge that comes through these um, sense organs is called pratyaksha pratyaksha literally means presented to the aksha presented to the sense organ pratyaksha in all indian languages also we have pratyaksha we say in bengali in uh, hindi pratyaksha so literally pratyaksha means that which is presented prati aksha to each of the sense organs. What is presented to the eyes are presented forms which we see, shape and color. And to the ears are presented sound. Just now you are hearing that is pratyaksha. Shabda, pr shabda pratyaksha, you are hearing sound. And then to the nose is presented fragrance, odors. To the tongue is presented taste. To the skin is presented touch, you know, warmth and pressure and heat and cold and all of that. So, um, this is called Pratyaksha. This is one kind of knowledge. Pratyaksha. 
that which is beyond the range of our senses. So right now I'm talking to you and you are all Pratyaksha for me because I can see you. You, are, you can see me and you can also hear me. I am Pratyaksha for you. My form is Pratyaksha for you. My voice is Pratyaksha for you. This is Pratyaksha. In, in English, perceptual knowledge. Perceptual knowledge. What is beyond the range of our senses? So what's there in, in Central Park right now? We cannot see. That is beyond the range of our aksha, beyond the range of our senses. So that is called paroksha, beyond aksha, beyond senses. Remote, in other words, in English we put it remote, paroksha. And there can be paroksha knowledge. A lot of our knowledge is actually paroksha, where we, somebody comes and tells you, this is what is going on. There is a big crowd out there in um, the sheep meadow in, in Central Park because Sunday crowd is there. It's a beautiful day out there in Manhattan. How do you know that? Did you see it yourself? No, you heard about it. Now, somebody told you. That's paroksha. You read about it in a book. You haven't seen it yet. It's paroksha. And uh, you can infer it scientifically. You don't see it directly with your eyes, but you infer many things. You read about it and you, you maybe perform experiments and you come to a conclusion. Anumana, the, uh, the process of inference, that's also paroksha, beyond the range of our senses. So now you have got two kinds of knowledge, pratyaksha and paroksha. Then what is aparoksha? By... Literally, by definition, that which is not paroksha, that is not beyond the range of your senses, that is called aparoksha. Aparoksha literally means not paroksha, not remote. So, pratyaksha also will be included under aparoksha. But, here's the problem. Pratyaksha, the perceptual knowledge, depends on our sense organs. If I am using my eyes to get the knowledge of seeing you, the moment I close my eyes, I can't see you because this knowledge is not actually direct. This knowledge, my consciousness depends on the mind and the sense organs in order to deliver sound and form and taste and um, touch and smell. All the pratyaksha inputs, they come through senses and they are dependent on the senses. They are mediated through the senses. You see, all our knowledge, our, our perceptual knowledge is mediated through the senses. So that's why uh, aparoksha is a special category which is not the sensory knowledge as such, uh, which is, ev is more direct than sensory knowledge. What is more direct than seeing? You? So I am seeing. Yeah. I am seeing people around here. It seems to be pretty direct to me. I can see and hear and smell and taste and touch. What is more direct than that? More direct than that is my own existence. I know that, um, you know, that Dora is here, for example. How do, if you ask me, how do you know that, Swami? Because I see. When I see Dora there, what kind of knowledge is it? Pratyaksha. Perceptual knowledge. I have direct perceptual knowledge of, of Dora. But is this really direct? It depends on my eyes. To see. This is called Pratyaksha. But Aparoksha is my own existence. So if somebody asks that, uh, where you are you here right now? I say, yes, I am here. If you ask, how do you know that, Swami? Is it Pratyaksha or Paroksha? Is it something that you see? Do you have to check? I am here or do you have to touch? Yes, I am here. Or is it even paroksha? If you ask people, am I here? Do people have to tell me? That, yes, Swami, you are there. Then I am, oh, thank God I am here. No, my own existence is revealed to me directly to myself. That is called aparoksha. Aparoksha is not indirect knowledge, remote knowledge, which you read about or hear about. That is not aparoksha. It's not even sensory knowledge which we get through the senses, that is Pratyaksha. But our, the only one thing is like that, is our own existence. Yeah. As long as we are capable of knowing anything, our own existence is prior to all of it, is known prior to all of it, by a very peculiar thing. It is self-evident. Self-evident. This is Aparoksha. 
नॉट परोक्ष इनडायरेक्ट अपरोक्ष नॉट इनडायरेक्ट डबल नेगेटिव अपरोक्ष दे इज अ वर्ड इन इंग्लिश इमीडिएट 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 हियर मीन्स नॉट इन टाइम इमीडिएट बट इमीडिएट मीन्स विदाउट मीडिएशन विदाउट गोइंग थ्रू समथिंग एल्स सो फॉर एग्जाम्पल टू सी यू इट इज मीडिएटेड बाई माई आईज टू हियर मी इट इज मीडिएटेड बाई योर ईयर्स सो इट इज मीडिएटेड बट माई ओन एग्जिस्टेंस इज नॉट मीडिएटेड बाई एनी थिंग इट्स डिरेक्टली रिवील टू मी दिस इज कॉल्ड डिरेक्ट नॉलेज और अपरोक्ष little wrinkle here little more subtle point is there um, is this that consider our mental states joy and pain and pleasure uh, memory i can remember something i cannot remember something all our mental states right now do we, uh, uh, how are we, how do we know our mental states our mental states are aparoksha because they are directly revealed to our consciousness so if you make that further distinction then you will see the mental states themselves are aparoksha they are because they are directly revealed to our consciousness you don't have to see you cannot see hear smell taste our mental states you don't have to wait for somebody else to tell you that you are feeling pain if i feel a sharp pain do i have to ask somebody am i feeling pain if i have to ask somebody then you are not feeling pain I'm feeling joy, and to ask somebody, "Am I happy?" This is a silly thing. Yes, of course, you're directly. Your own happiness is revealed to you directly. Our own pleasure and pain are revealed to us directly. Our mental states are revealed to us directly. So, can we not say our mental states are aparoksha? So, in one way of looking at it, more subtly, is that the mental states are aparoksha. Then, what about our self, my own existence? So, further classification is made. See how subtle they have gone. How deep they have gone into this kind of thinking. and uh, in the upanishads so our self the atman has a further classification called sakshat aparokshat immediate non indirect <laughs> it becomes incomprehensible if you translate into english sakshat means uh, immediate and uh, aparoksha means not remote or not indirect but we will not go into that distinction i'm i'm going to set aside that further distinction uh, i'm just going to say our self is aparoksha our own existence is aparoksha and to realize the real nature of our own existence which we don't know yet to realize that this is the infinite unlimited consciousness immortal this is called aparoksha gyana so this realization this direct realization we talk about it's not something that is seen by the senses not pratyaksha it is not something that is read about or heard about or believed in not paroksha it is aparoksha gyana direct knowledge so i hope keeping that in mind let's go deeper into it a very helpful distinction is made by vidyaranya this direct knowledge aparoksha gyana vidyaranya says actually it is of two types and this distinction is very helpful when we discuss advaita vedanta aparoksha gyana direct knowledge is of two types what are these two types one is the very nature of brahman or atman it is ever there ever shining as i said where is it everywhere and here when is it every when and now what is it it is you yourself so it is all the time present shining consciousness as the the unlimited awareness which is always there consider the 10th man story in the 10th man story that person who was counting was always the 10th person it would he did not become the 10th person when he realized that i am the 10th person even when he thought that the 10th person is dead uh, drowned even then he was himself the 10th person when he was making a mistake in counting counting only 9 and leaving himself out he was still the 10th person and when it was pointed out that the 10th person is alive he was himself the 10th person and when finally he he was told you are the 10th he was himself the 10th person so that he was the 10th person is always there he's not dead or drowned or missing no similarly i as brahman am always there the reality called brahman is ever ever present ever shining forth as the very existence of everything that you see now we don't recognize it 
we say that it is a chair and a table and a person, a man and a woman and space and earth and sun. We say these are existing things. But existence itself is shining forth through all these existing things. It is consciousness itself shining forth through our experiences of hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, seeing. All conscious experiences, remembering, desiring, loving, hating, enjoying, suffering, all conscious experiences that one consciousness is shining through. And it is unlimited existence consciousness. It is full. That is the ananda nature, the, the fulfillment nature of it. It is always present. So this is the first type of direct knowledge. Aparoksha jnana, the so first type of Aparoksha jnana is the ever-present nature of Brahman. This is called in Vedanta, Swaprakash, the self-illumined, self-luminous nature of the ultimate reality. It is always there. This is number one, direct knowledge. Direct knowledge, type one, which is the very nature of that ultimate reality. Natural direct knowledge, natural aparoksha jnana. The second type, just like the tenth person was always present, is always present. The second type, the second type of aparoksha jnana is what happens when the tenth person realizes, oh, I am the tenth. When the wise man said, you are the tenth, count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, I am the tenth. At that moment, what happens? That, that tenth person realizes, I am the tenth directly. That is the second type of direct knowledge called Aparoksha Jnana. Second type of Aparoksha Jnana. First type of Aparoksha Jnana, he was always the tenth person, whether he knew it or not. We are always Brahman. Like that sadhu told me, Jano ya na jano, mano ya na mano, tum hi ram. You know it or you do not know it, whether you believe it or you don't believe it, you are God. That ever-present, ever-shining, um, direct uh, revelation of Brahman, the direct shining forth of Brahman, that is first type of Aparoksha Jnana. The second type is what happens when the tenth man realizes, oh, I am the tenth. The second type is what happens when we realize, I am Brahman, Aham Brahmasmi, what we call enlightenment, realization. The second type of Aparoksha Jnana. When does it happen? When the Paroksha Jnana, the indirect knowledge that there is the tenth person, becomes converted into, oh, I am the tenth. When the indirect knowledge that there is Brahman, infinite existence, consciousness, bliss, becomes converted into, aham Brahmasmi, I am that infinite Brahman. This is the second type of Aparoksha Jnana and this is called enlightenment. This is a very important distinction. It's a very subtle but important distinction. The ever-present natural aparoksha jnana becomes converted into the direct realization, I am that, I am Brahman. That is the second type of aparoksha jnana. And this is the distinction drawn by Vidyaranya. Very helpful distinction. Now, think about it. The original Brihadaranya Upanishad mantra. Ayam Masmiti Purusha, Atmanam Jed Vijaniyat, Ayam Masmiti Purusha. If the individual were to realize, I am this infinite existence, consciousness, bliss, which type of Aparoksha Jnana is it? Which type of direct knowledge? Second type. Second type. Uh, it is the se and so what we call enlightenment, self realization, Brahma Jnana is the second type of. Aparoksha Jnana in this distinction. What is ever available, always evident, we don't see it. How is this possible? Something ever available and you don't see it? It's because you don't recognize it. You don't recognize it. A tourist who has read about Central Park and is uh, now, uh, read means may have seen in the brochure or in the computer, now he's working somewhere down in uh, some, uh, in Strawberry Field and asks, where is Central Park? And then somebody says, you are in Central Park. Oh, this is Central Park. Was Central Park always available to that person? Yes, you are seeing it. Uh, that always seen Central Park, not recognized. Now it is recognized. 
Similarly, the always shining forth Brahman, Satchidananda, is now recognized as I am. It is specifically known, clearly known, directly uh, intuited as I am this Brahman. That Brahman is nothing but I. I am nothing but Brahman. This, this Tattvamasi, the meaning of that thou art, that is suddenly realized as I am Brahman. This is the second type of Aparoksha Kyana. So this distinction is uh, important. It's worth thinking about. So what we are looking for is not something out there, not something in future, not something else other than me. It is I myself. It is now, it is here. Where? Just like Central Park is available to a person standing in strawberry field. Just like the 10th person was available to the person who was counting 9 and missing the 10th. And was told that there is the 10th. Himself the 10th. Similarly, my infinite nature is available to me right now. You must feel eager. Where is it? What am I missing in my experience? The beautiful distinction. Now another point which Vidyarinya raises we normally don't think about it. What about all this we are studying now in Vedanta? After enlightenment, all that we have studied, will it become wrong? Will it become wrong knowledge? Will it become invalid in Sanskrit? Aprama. Prama, valid knowledge. And uh, Aprama, invalid knowledge. I still, the problem is when I talk, at the back of my mind, I'm always aware of my teachers. <laughs> I can still, I can see them shaking their <laughs> head and saying, there is no valid knowledge and invalid knowledge. Knowledge is always valid. That which is valid, you call that knowledge. The other one is not knowledge. <laughs> yeah. Both in uh, Western philosophy, it's called justified true belief. Anyway, we'll not go into that. I'm just making a general statement. Valid knowledge and invalid knowledge. Prama and Aprama. So, um, what is the question? The question is, we never think about it because we are so eager to attain enlightenment, God realization, self-knowledge. Think about it. Once you realize that uh, you are Brahman, you become enlightened. And maybe all become enlightened in this life. Huh? Once we do that and look back upon all that we have studied, all these classes and lectures and YouTube and so on, will it all be wrong? Will it all be false? Because why this question arises is, then it throws a question, a uh, shadow of doubt on what we are doing right now. And it, it's a concern because we all read about how enlightened persons, when they become enlightened, they say, oh, you have no idea. When you, when you realize it, you, it, is, it is absolutely nothing to do with what you are studying in books and you are intellectualizing. No. And it's true that it can be so startling that uh, when you actually look back upon that, you, you see that I, I just didn't know mm. till the veil fell from my eyes. But then it, it raises the question, all that we are studying, philosophizing, books and lectures and thinking about it, is it wrong? And Vidyaranya says, thank God, he says, no, it's not wrong. It is knowledge. What is knowledge? The indirect knowledge that you get. Paroksha jnana. Paroksha jnana is also jnana, is also prama, is valid knowledge. Realization, aparoksha jnana, the direct realization, direct knowledge is of course valid. That is enlightenment. But before that, the Vedanta that we are studying, that which tells you that there is Brahman, is it wrong? No, it's not wrong. It's correct. It's valid knowledge. Why? And we don't think about these things. It's only when these questions are raised then we begin to consider why would somebody doubt it? And what are the answers to the doubts? There can be four big doubts about this kind of knowledge. What we are doing in Vedanta now. Four big doubts. That indirect knowledge, paroksha jnana, is it at all knowledge or not? Four doubts. And uh, Vidyaranya raises each one and shows that no. It's not, it is this not a correct doubt. It is knowledge. Uh, Vedanta, which we study, the indirect knowledge is knowledge. What are the doubts? That you can say it is uh, not knowledge, it's invalid, 
if you have a cancelling knowledge afterwards. What do I mean by that? By that, for example, <clears throat> I thought I was this body and mind. This is who I am. When I become enlightened, Chidananda Rupaha Shivoham, I am of the nature of pure consciousness and bliss. And that knowledge cancels my earlier assumption that I am the body mind. So why, when I thought I was only this body and mind, that is wrong. And that it, that's the wrongness of that is exposed by my enlightenment. Shankaracharya sings, Mano buddhyahankara chittani naham. I'm not only the, not the body, I'm not even the mind, the, the, uh, the ego, the memory, uh, the intellect. And so it is cancelled. That previous identification with the body mind, that was wrong. It is revealed by this, this new cancelling knowledge. This is called Badha Jnana. Cancelling knowledge. My earlier presumptions are cancelled now. But this knowledge that we are studying in Vedanta, is it ever cancelled? It's not cancelled. What is the indirect knowledge? There is Brahman. Satyam Jnanam Anantam Brahma. Infinite existence and awareness is Brahman. When I become enlightened, I am Brahman. Will that, that knowledge, will it become cancelled? No. It's just like when the wise man told the people who are crying, don't worry, the tenth man exists. What kind of knowledge? Paroksha jnana, indirect knowledge. They still don't know where is the tenth man. When this person realizes, oh, I am the tenth, will the previous knowledge, tenth man exists, will it be cancelled? Will he realize, oh, the tenth man does not exist? No, not at all. It will be confirmed by his realization. And when I realize I am Brahman, then will it be confirmed? Yes, I will realize I am infinite. I am infinite existence. I am infinite awareness. I am pure. I am ever liberated. Uh, Buddha, Mukta, Swabhava. And this will be confirmed. It will not be cancelled. So since there is no cancelling knowledge afterwards, the indirect knowledge gained by study of Vedanta, the Vedanta Vakyas, that there is Brahman, Paroksha Jnana, that will not be uh, invalid. That's not wrong knowledge. This is the first objection, which is uh, set aside. The second one is a little more subtle. The second one is, see, there is Brahman, but you don't know the specific. That there is Central Park, but you don't know that this is Central Park, in Strawberry Field. There is the 10th man, but you did not know that you are the 10th man. There is something called Brahman, we get a vague idea. That happens in once we are introduced to philosophy, to Vedanta. We get, all of us, we have this general feeling, it's quite possible. And these uh, great Mahatmas and philosophers and Shankara and, uh, and the texts, Upanishads and all, they are saying that there is an infinite existence, consciousness, bliss. And I really want it to be true. <laughs> so it must be true. But the objection is, in technical terms, Vidyarinya calls it Vyakti Anullekha. The specifics are not known. If the specifics are not known, can you consider it knowledge at all? Isn't it wrong? Vyakti Anullekha. No, it is not wrong. For the simple reason is that even when the specifics are not known, how, is, how does the general knowledge become wrong? Even when I do not specifically know that standing in strawberry fields is the same thing as standing in, in Central Park, uh, even if I don't know that, in general, I have just a general idea of it. I don't have the specific knowledge that this is Central Park. Even then, the general idea is not wrong. The tenth man, when he realized that um, I am the tenth, now he has got specific knowledge. There is the tenth, per tenth person exists, that was general knowledge. Now, I am the tenth. This is specific knowledge. But that general knowledge is not invalidated by the specific knowledge. Vidyarinya, of course, does not give strawberry field example or uh, anything else. He gives a, a more scriptural example. He says, when you read in the ritualistic portion of the Vedas, by performing these rituals, yajnas, you will go to heaven. Swarga kama yajeta, let those desirous of going to heaven after death perform these uh, rituals. Now, the person, when you read up, when this person reads about heaven, what are the facilities available in heaven? 
he does not know it specifically he just knows it in general it is a indirect knowledge but does that make it wrong no it doesn't make it wrong just you don't know the specifics because you have not experienced it for yourself so when you experience it for yourself those uh, specifics will confirm your general knowledge they will not cut down your general knowledge so the this what is the objection here because the specific knowledge i am brahman is not yet realized therefore the the earlier knowledge which vedanta gives there is brahman that is wrong no in the absence of specifics also the general knowledge itself remains valid then the third one third objection what don't forget don't don't be disoriented what are we talking about here the indirect knowledge that there is brahman is it knowledge at all what we get from vedanta and all this we are doing before and pre enlightenment is this uh, knowledge at all is it at all worthwhile uh, and the third objection will be possible objection that it's not knowledge what you are doing in vedanta it is not not, not knowledge at all third objection will be it's a subtle point here a powerful point it says brahman is aparoksha you have yourself said brahman is direct always shining forth and you are brahman when you say that there is brahman you are presenting brahman as paroksha that there is some brahman that which is aparoksha is presented as paroksha that which is direct knowledge is presented as indirect isn't it wrong hmm. no it is not wrong because first of all um the same scriptures the same upanishads give you the direct instruction also that you are brahman there is brahman and you are that brahman tattva masi upanishad tells you that and upanishad does not say that it is a remote brahman it tells you that there is brahman and it is you and also during the study of vedanta this whole question of direct indirect this is a theoretical matter it it does not pop up really we're talking about it we study and we come to know of the existence of brahman that there is an infinite reality and that ultimately i am that infinite reality this is this is how we study uh, vedanta it's only from that enlightened perspective when you look back and do a little bit of theorizing oh what i learned before my enlightenment that was indirect there is brahman now i realize directly that i am brahman all these distinctions it would make sense after enlightenment we understand vedanta for an enlightened person he said you understand but you understand only indirectly the he will that enlightened person will tell us so from that enlightened person's perspective see from our perspective direct knowledge indirect knowledge does not make much sense because until we get that direct enlightenment it will not be very vividly clear to us what is meant by these two distinctions we can only theoretically form an uh, understanding of that so the answer to this question is that the upanishads do not actually present brahman as uh, indirect they tell you that there is some brahman and but they are never ever telling you that brahman is indirect they in fact the upanishads tell you brahman brahman is direct you are that brahman so this directness to uh, given one sentence answer to this objection directness indirectness is superimposed upon brahman see what happens is after enlightenment the 10th person when he realizes i am the 10th person and then when he wants to tell his other friends he says see if you count like this 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 you will realize you are the 10th person now after realizing that when this person counts again maybe to explain to others during um, vidyarnya makes this point during the beginning of the counting 1 2 3 or at the middle of the counting 8 9 or at the end of the counting 10 i am the 10th at no point is he confused about uh, who is uh, the 10th person because he knows i am the 10th person what is meant here is after enlightenment when you go back and study the same upanishads when you study there is brahman will you are you are enlightened now you realize i am brahman when you see in the book um, there is brahman an infinite existence satyam gyanam anantam brahman infinite awareness existence is brahman will you ever feel you the enlightened person will you ever feel oh there is some brahman no 
you know that you are that Brahman, which is being talked about here. So, from an enlightened person's perspective, Brahman is never paroksha, Brahman is never remote, Brahman is never at a distance. I am Brahman is ever evident to this person, to this enlightened being. So this charge of presenting the aparoksha Brahma as paroksha Brahma, it does not stick. Uh, Upanishads, this is only this uh, theoretical uh, sort of accounting which we do uh, from an enlightened perspective. Then the fourth objection might be that the indirect knowledge is about the existence of Brahman and the direct knowledge is I am Brahman. Is that not so? Who is asking? The opponent is asking us. And we as Vedantins, we say yes. Brahma asti. There is Brahman. That's indirect knowledge. Aham Brahma asmi. I am Brahman. That is direct knowledge. So the existence part of it is revealed by the indirect knowledge. Correct? You say yes. And uh, the consciousness part of it, chit. I am that. Huh? Consciousness is only experienced in ourselves. I am that is revealed by I am Brahman, the direct knowledge. Is it not so? You say yes. And then they say, in that case, your um, uh, indirect knowledge is incomplete. You call it amsha jnana. Only partially you know it. How can it be knowledge? You have only partial knowledge of, of uh, the reality. Uh, only when you realize, I am Brahman, you realize existence and consciousness and the bliss aspect, Satchidananda, all are realized, I am that. But when you read about it, there is Brahman, Brahma Asti, Satchidananda. Then it is only partial knowledge. You are really know only part of it. And Vidyaranya says that's the nature of all knowledge. That does not make knowledge invalid. Anything that we know, we know only a part of it. Right now I'm looking at this lectern, this podium. I can't see the front of it. You can see the front of it there. But I can't see it. Does that make my knowledge of the podium, uh, it's incomplete. Is it wrong? No. Vidyaranya gives up the most obvious thing, ghatak jnana. Knowledge of a pot. You see a pot. You're holding a pot. But you really, even if you're holding a pot, you can't see the other side of the pot. You, can, you can't see inside the pot. You don't know the principles of ceramics unless you are a pottery expert. Uh, you don't know the chemical composition of the paint which has been applied on the pot. We don't know anything about, many things about the pot. Does that mean that I know I'm holding a pot, this knowledge is invalid? No. All of our knowledge in day-to-day -day life, all of our knowledge is only a partial knowledge. We don't know everything, we know only part of it. And that knowledge, we never consider that to be invalid, just because we know a part of it. So if, you, if Upanishads give you the knowledge, Brahma, Asti, there is Brahman, and that's only a part of it. But... That's uh, not wrong. You know the existence aspect, sat aspect of Brahman. That's not wrong. That's also valid. Uh, otherwise, every knowledge will be wrong. All our day-to-day -day knowledge would have to be considered in invalid. The Jainas have a statement, Ananta dharmakam vastu. Reality has infinite aspects. Infinite aspects. Every object has infinite aspects. When you know any object, how much of it do we know? Very little of it. We know very little of it. Only a slice of it we know. So that knowledge of that slice, amsha jnana, is not wrong knowledge. So, so this, is, this objection is also set aside. When you set aside this objection, and that, so what, what, what have we proved by this? That since you don't have any cancelling knowledge, the original indirect knowledge is also knowledge. Vedanta knowledge which we studied is also knowledge. Since you do not have, uh, since um, the non-specific knowledge, non-specific nature of that knowledge, um, you have only a general idea of Brahman, uh, that is also knowledge. It is not cancelled by the, it, it is only confirmed by the future enlightenment. The so-called indirect presentation, parokshatvam, that does not invalidate um, Vedantic knowledge. And finally, only one aspect of it you know. You don't know the other aspect. You know the sat aspect. You don't know the chit aspect. You know that there is Brahman, but that I am Brahman, you have not realized it. Does that make uh, Vedantic knowledge uh, not knowledge? The indirect knowledge, paroksha jnana, is not knowledge at all? No, not even that. At this point, another opponent, 
will say, aha, got you. You said, sat part of Brahman, chit part of Brahman. So Brahman has parts? <laughs> By your own admission, you said there is a, there is a sat part. And there is a chit part, there is an existence part of Brahman, there is a consciousness. So existence, consciousness, bliss, are these parts of Brahman? You said infinite awareness, existence is Brahman. Uh, satyam, jnanam, anantam, Brahman. So existence is one part of Brahman and consciousness is another part of Brahman. So Brahman has parts. If something has parts, that then that thing has been put together by the combination of the parts. That which has been combined can fall apart. Anityam, then the danger will be your Brahman will become impermanent. That which has parts can never be permanent. The Buddha said it well. All compounded things decay. Everything that has come together will fall apart. Everything that has been produced will be destroyed. What is production? Putting parts together. Assembly line, we know. So putting parts together, production, it will decay. It will be destroyed. What has been produced will be de destroyed. What is born will die. All compounded things decay. It will become uncompounded once, at one time. So if Brahman has parts, then your Vedanta is in trouble. Advaita is in trouble. And we say, Brahman does not have parts. When we talk about what you said, existence part of Brahman, the consciousness part of Brahman. We say that, that it is only from the perspective of duality that you have to speak about parts. All teaching is done in duality. It is only in samsara, in duality, in dvaita, that we can have Vedanta, Vedanta classes, we can have ignorance, we can have enlightenment, we can have release. In Brahman, in one infinite, unlimited reality, where is Vedanta, where is ignorance, where is liberation? Gaudapada says in the Mandukya Karika that there is no creation of the universe, no cessation of the universe, no bondage, no one seeking liberation from bondage, no one who is liberated, no one who is doing spiritual practices. This is the ultimate truth. Ittyesha paramarthata. From that perspective. But from our perspective, all these things you have to talk about. Tulsi Das Ji says, some, somewhere he says, Show me the person who can teach Advaita without Dvaita. I will become his student. Who can teach non-duality without duality? I will become the student of such a person. I will become his disciple. Not possible. Two, nearly 2000 years ago, the great Buddhist master Nagarjuna said, Samritti manashritya paramartham nadhigamyate Without taking the help of the transactional vavaharika level, no one realizes the absolute. What is the transactional level? Subject, object, samsara, duality, ignorance, suffering, spirituality, religion, enlightenment. All this is uh, within the transactional realm. So, the opponent will say, fine speech, but answer, is existence, consciousness, please, are they parts of Brahman or not? Ah. We are, it is a way of speaking. How? When we say, so this is a very important clarification. We keep saying existence, consciousness, place, sat, chit, ananda, as if we are saying with something very profound. The non-dualist, Advaitin, finally admits, it's not even that. It's not even existence, consciousness, place, not even sat, chit, ananda. In comparison with the uh, mithya jagat, the false world, samsara is false. World, you know, Vedanta says Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. Brahman is the reality and the world is false. In comparison with the false, false world, the false entities, Mithya entities of the world, we say Brahman is Sat, absolutely real. These are all appearances. Brahman is the reality. In comparison to these, Brahman is Sat, existence. In comparison to the insentient world, objects all out there, Brahman is the pure subject, consciousness, chit. In comparison to what? The jada, the insentient. Samsara is jada. Everything you experience in samsara is jada. But when I say you experience, you the experiencer are chit consciousness. With respect to this universe. This universe is dukkha. 
प्राप्य इमम असुखम लोकम कृष्ण से इज इन द भगवद गीता भजस्व मान वर्शिप मी हैविंग कम टू दिस वर्ल्ड ऑफ मिजरी ऑफ सॉरो बुद्ध से इज सर्वम दुखम ऑल ऑफ इट इज दिस इज सॉरो इन सांख्य यू बिगिन द सांख्य फिलोसफी दुख त्रय अभिघाता एफ्लिक्टेड बाय द थ्री थ्री फोर सॉरो ऑफ लाइफ सो सॉरो द वर्ल्ड इज परवेडेड बाय सॉरो इन कॉन्ट्रास्ट टू दैट in order to distinguish it from that brahman is it like this world then no it is ananda it is fulfillment sat chit and ananda are there in order to distinguish it from samsara which is mithya false which is jada insentient which is dukkha maya pervaded by sorrow that's why we call in order to distinguish brahman all of this vidyarinya uses one word vyavritti artham in order to distinguish that's it you have to understand everything from that one one word vyavritti artham in order to distinguish brahman from samsara you talk about these things sat chit and ananda then these are not parts of brahman no brahman has no parts then what is brahman hmm. silence maunam vyakhyanam the best explanation of brahman the best description of brahman is silence but if i keep silent no sunday lecture therefore sat chidananda and all of these upanishad gives us <laughs> upanishads are texts so they have to use words these words are used to help us go beyond the words for a reality which is always there but it is not expressed uh, to express it you need words so in order to separate it from samsara we say sat chit ananda one more point which vidyaranya raises and i'm done we are talking about direct knowledge now vidyaranya not just vidyaranya this is an important point may sound um, um theoretical but it's an important distinction to make this is very important for vedanta this is a distinction between um the mahavakyas and the avantara vakyas the great sayings that thou art tatvamasi and all the other texts of vedanta so vedanta is upanishads upanishads have many sentences in those sentences many things are there there is the story of nachiketa there is a description of samsara there is a description of brahman and a few sentences which say you are that reality now in advaita vedanta a important distinction shankaracharya makes it and all advaita masters make it that there are two kinds of sentences one kind of sentence is most of the vedantic sentences are called avantar avantar literally means in sanskrit in sanskrit avantar in english you can translate as secondary auxiliary sometimes it translates supporting not central so most of the sentences are supporting what do they tell you they tell you that ultimately there is something called brahman they give you indirect knowledge very important distinction most of the sentences in vedanta and upanishads give you the indirect knowledge of brahman these are called avantara that there is brahman brahma asti there is the 10th man avantara secondary sentence see in the all the descriptions um the, in the 10th man story is so beautiful two sentences were uttered there there is brahman you are brahman uh, i'm sorry <laughs> there is the 10th man you are the 10th man there is the 10th man avantara secondary and you are the 10th mahavakya the great saying <laughs> equal to that you are that tatvamasi is mahavakya the great saying the, the great sentence that is uh, mukhya or central primary sentence which gives you the meaning of vedanta all the other sentences are supporting they tell you that brahman is there but that thou art tells you you are brahman where is this brahman what is this brahman you are that so this distinction is very important you are brahman aham brahmasmi i am brahman mahavakya i am atma brahma this very self is brahman mahavakya pragyanam brahma this awareness which we are experiencing this is brahman mahavakya but everything else avantara vakya secondary this distinction is important because consider for a while the nature of how we get knowledge from from uh, uh, texts the nature of knowledge is like this usually consider the the um, strawberry field central park example 
So the person who knew about Central Park, the tourist, has read about it on his uh, device that there is Central Park in a nice place in Manhattan to go for a walk. Uh, so this is Shabda. Words have given him a general idea, um, this indirect knowledge about. Does, does that person have direct experience of Central Park? Not yet. He just read about it. So the words give you indirect knowledge. And then when he goes directly to Central Park and looks around and sees, that is direct experience of Central Park. So notice, how, how did he get indirect knowledge and how did he get direct knowledge? He got indirect knowledge by reading, by listening, by the, through the words. Words gave him indirect knowledge. And what gave him direct knowledge of Central Park? Seeing. Actually going there and seeing it. Pratyaksha. Shabda, the words, are sources of knowledge, but they're sources of indirect knowledge. And Pratyaksha, perceptual knowledge, is, is, gives you direct knowledge of Central Park. Now, in the case of, this is normally so, whatever happens, generally we hear about it, read about it, and then we go and see it for ourselves. So, indirect knowledge by hearing or reading, and direct knowledge by um, seeing. Indirect knowledge by words, texts, and direct knowledge by perception. That's the normal state of it. This is how it works. But, in Vedanta, both are given by words. Direct knowledge, indirect knowledge is given by words and direct knowledge is also given by words. Indirect knowledge is given by avantara vakya, all the other sentences. And direct knowledge is given by the maha vakya, the great sentence, that thou art. See, again the tenth man story helps us here. The knowledge that the tenth man is there and the realization that I am the tenth man, both of them came through what? Words. The wise man's words, don't cry, the tenth man is there. Words. What kind of knowledge did, they, did these um, people get? Those who were crying, they got indirect knowledge. Through words. And just like Central Park is there, through words. But, how did the direct knowledge come? You are the tenth. Please count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Then ten. You are the tenth. Then the direct knowledge comes. But that's also words. Dashamas Tomasi, thou art the tenth. Those are also words. So through words alone, he got direct knowledge, he got indirect knowledge first, and then got direct knowledge. Similarly, in the Upanishads, through the Avantara Vakya and the Mahavakya, one gets indirect knowledge and then direct knowledge. This is an important distinction. In the normal way of looking at things, you hear about something and then you see it. But in, the, in enlightenment, you hear about it or read about it. And then the words themselves will give you the direct uh, experience, the direct, realize, direct knowledge or realization, the aparoksha jnana that arises out of the sentences. Which sentences give indirect knowledge? Avantara vakya, the secondary sentence, auxiliary sentence. Which sentences give you direct knowledge? Mahavakya, tattvamasi, that thou art. Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. I am Atma Brahma. This very self is Brahman. Pragyanam Brahma. Consciousness is Brahman. In fact, in fact, any sentence in the Upanishads which gives you an identity between yourself and that ultimate reality, that is Mahavakya. Jiva Brahma Aikya Bodhakam Vakya Mahavakyam. This is in Sanskrit. Uh, in the mantra which we are considering, the Brihadarnyak Upanishad mantra, that's also a Mahavakya. Think about it. Atmanam ched vijaniyat ayam asmeti purushaha. When the self is realized to be this infinite existence consciousness place, this one witness beyond the three states of waking, dreaming, deep sleep, this one witness consciousness underlying and witnessing the five sheets of the human personality, this one consciousness sakshi of the three bodies, physical, subtle and causal, when you realize this, then uh, you go beyond sorrow. What is this? This is Mahavakya. So even this Mriyadarana Upanishad can be considered Mahavakya. Conventionally we take four Mahavakyas, from one from each of the Vedas. But otherwise there are many such Mahavakyas in the uh, Upanishads, in, found in, uh, across, scattered across the Upanishads. Just one um, 
one point which I should have mentioned earlier, an interesting observation. Just think about it. When I said, you can teach Advaita only through Advaita. It's only with respect to samsara, which is uh, false, which is uh, um, jara, insentient, uh, which is full of sorrow, dukkha. Then only you can express Brahman as Sat Chit Ananda. The tenth man story helps us there also. You see, the tenth man story, think about it. The, what was the instruction? Thou art the tenth. Thou art the tenth. That was the final instruction given by the wise man and he realized I am the tenth. Notice, this thou art the tenth works only when the other nine are present. If you take that fellow aside and tell him, you are the tenth. <laughs> what, what is it? How can I be the tenth? The tenth of what? It's only when those nine are present and you count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, I am the tenth and the problem is solved. Without those nine, it's no use saying you are the tenth. You can't say anything to that person. Uh, similarly, it's only in samsara and for the purpose of liberation from samsara, the ultimate reality is expressed through words, sat, chit and ananda, but even the words do not capture. It is truly beyond words, beyond words, beyond conceptions. I pray to the Lord, to Sri Ramakrishna, Holy Mother and Swami Vivekananda to bless us all. May we attain freedom from sufferings in this world right now. So many people are in suffering. And the ultimate freedom from suffering, the realization that I am infinite existence, consciousness, bliss. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu. Take care everybody and stay safe.